Dr. and Dr. Avila from Drona Institute. Today, we can study about fibroid. First of all, what do you mean by fibroid? That is, we know that fibroid is one among the most commonest benign tumor seen in the uterus as well as in the female body. Okay, that is, fibroid is one among the most common benign tumor seen in the female body as well as in the uterus. Okay, then why it is called fibroid? Since it is having fibrous tissue consistency, this is known as fibroid. Okay. Then why did this is known as leomyoma? That is, we know that fibroid is also known as leomyoma. Why is this so? That is, fibroid is a smooth muscle leoplasm that mainly originates from the uterine myometria. So it is called a leomyoma. That is, it is a smooth muscle leoplasm that typically originates from the myometria. So it is called a leomyoma. Leomyoma. Okay. Then coming to the next point, that is, what about the risk factors, or what are the factors which increases the incidence of fibroid, or what are the factors, or which are the factors which reduces the risk of fibroid? Okay. Before that, uh, we can say that that is fibroid is mainly estrogen dependent tumor. Okay. That is. Fibroid is mainly estrogen dependent, but estrogen and progesterone both contributes to the cause of fibroid. Even that, the most important cause or most dependent is estrogen. Okay, that is fibroid is estrogen dependent tumor. Okay, then coming to the risk factors of fibroid. Okay, first of all, what, which are the factors that increases the risk of fibroid? Mainly, since it is estrogen dependent. The factors such as malignity, okay, also then obesity, then hyperestrogenic state. These all factors increases the risk of fibroid, okay. That is malignity, then obesity, then hyperestrogenic states. These are the factors which increases the risk of fibroid, okay. Then coming to the factors which decreases the risk of fibroid, mainly multiparity. You know that we know that multiparity, uh, there will be a reduced risk of fibroid. Okay, these are the risk factors of fibroid. That is, which are the factors which increases the risk of fibroid and which are the factors that reduces the risk of fibroid. Okay, then coming to the classification of fibroid. Okay, that is what about the classification of fibroid. Okay, first of all, we can see here. Okay, that is mainly fibroid is classified into Fibroids seen in the body of the uterus and also seen in the cervix. That is mainly the classification of fibroid is mainly based on the anatomical location. Okay, based on the anatomical location, fibroid is mainly classified into body and cervix. That is fibroid seen in the body and fibroid seen in the cervix. Okay, then coming to the fibroid seen in the body of the uterus, they are again classified into three main types. Okay, that is here you can see that is interstitial fibroid, then subferous fibroid and submucous fibroid. Okay, interstitial fibroid, subferous fibroid and submucous fibroid. Then interstitial fibroid, it is the most common fibroid that comprises 75 percentage. Okay, interstitial fibroid, 75 percentage. Okay, then coming to the next that is subserous fibroid. Subserous fibroid contributes 15 percentage of all fibroid. Okay, subserous 15 percentage. Then some mucus fibroid contributes 5 percentage. Okay, that is the Frequency of the occurrence of this fibroid that is most common is in the special fibroid, which contributes 75 percentage. Then, is it then subserous fibroid? It contributes how many percentage? 15 percentage. Then, sub one sub mucus fibroid this contributes 5 percentage. Okay, then coming to the first pipe that is. Then this interstitial fibroid, this is also known as intramural fibroid, okay. Interstitial fibroid is also known as intramural fibroid, okay. Then coming to the subserous fibroid, okay. This subserous fibroid is again classified into parasitic or boundary fibroid or broad ligament fibroid, okay. That is this size subserous fibroid can be a type, it can be classified into 
Sometimes it can be dog ligament fibroid and sometimes it can be parasitic fibroid. Okay. That is about the subcellus fibroid. Okay. Then submucous fibroid can also be of two types. That is sessile fibroids and pedangulated fibroids. Okay. That is submucous can be either in form from in two ways. That is sessile or pedangulated. Okay. Then the cervical fibroids it can be divided into anterior Fibre, anterior cervical fibroid, then posterior, then lateral, and also central. Okay, this is about the classification of the fibroid. Okay, first of all, we have we are classifying the fibroid fibroid based on the anatomical location. Okay, mainly the uterine fibroid is mainly classified into two types. Okay, that is fibroid seen in the body of the uterus and fibroid seen in the cervix of the uterus. Okay. First of all, the fibroids seen among the fibroids seen in the body of the uterus, they are again classified into interstitial fibroids, then subcellus fibroid and submucous fibroid. Okay. Then interstitial fibroid is the most common one which comprises 75%. Then subcellus fibroid comprises 15% and submucous fibroid comprises 5%. Okay. Then this subcellus fibroid again can be come in two ways. That is, it can be it can be a broad ligament fibroid. Sometimes it can occur as a wandering fibroid or parasitic fibroid. Okay. Then this submucous fibroid can also come in two ways. That is either as sessile or either as pedangulated. Okay. Then the cervical fibroid can come again divided into anterior cervical fibroid, posterior, lateral, and central cervical fibroid. Okay. These are about the main classification of the fibroid. Then coming to the first, that is intramural or interstitial fibroid. Okay, that is intramural or interstitial fibroid. We know that this is the most common fibroid. Okay, that is 75% of the fibroid is interstitial fibroid. Okay, that is 75% of the fibroid seen is mainly interstitial fibroid or intramural fibroid. Okay. Then what is the peculiarity of this interstitial fibroid or why this fibroid is uh, why this fibroid is called as interstitial that is this fibroid that is interstitial fibroid lies within the wall of the uterus okay that is interstitial fibroid or intramural fibroid lies within the wall of the uterus so this is known as interstitial fibroid okay then uh, initially, all the fibroids are interstitial in position. Okay, then they are pushed either towards the peritoneum, they become subcellus fibroid. Okay, and either they are pushed towards the uterine cavity, they become submucous fibroid. Okay, that is initially all fibroids are interstitial fibroids in origin, but when they grow, they are pushed towards or inwards. That is when pushed towards or pushed outwards. They are they form subcellus fibroid, okay. And when they push inverse or and they push inverse to the uterine cavity, they form the submucous fibroid, okay. That is, first of all, intramural fibroid is the most commonest fibroid, and it is mainly it is located on the uterine wall, okay, or it lies within the wall of the uterus, so it is known as interstitial fibroid, okay. Then coming to the next type that is subcellus fibroid. Okay, that is subcellus fibroid comprises 15 percentage. Then why it is called subcellus fibroid? Subcellus that is it originates from the myocyte adjacent to the uterine serosa. Okay, that is subcellus fibroid originates from the myocyte which is adjacent to the uterine serosa, and so this is known as subcellus fibroid. Okay. And this grow towards the peritoneal cavity. Okay, that is, this is directed outwards towards the peritoneal cavity. Okay, and so this is known as subcellus fibroid. First of all, this is originated from the myocyte adjacent to the uterine serosa, and so it is called subcellus fibroid. And they grow outwards, that is, towards the peritoneal cavity. Okay, then coming to the subtypes, that is. This subcellus fibroid is covered by the peritoneum. Okay. And when this covering, that is, when this subcellus fibroid is completely covered by the peritoneum, 
Okay, it occurs at pedicle and this is known as triangulated fibroid. Okay, that is the subtilus fibroid. When completely covered by peritoneum, it occurs in pedicle and then it is known as triangulated fibroid. Okay, then coming to the parasitic fibroid. Okay, parasitic fibroid means when this subtilus fibroid is covered by the peritoneum and it is torn and it becomes parasitic fibroid. Okay. Then coming to the next, that is brown ligament fibroid. Brown ligament fibroid. Brown ligament fibroid means sometimes this subsurus fibroid may be pushed up in between the layers of the broad ligament. And so it is called as broad ligament fibroid. Okay, that is sometimes the subsurus fibroid is pushed in between the layers of broad ligament. And so this is known as broad ligament fibroid. Okay, first of all, we have studied that Subgenous fibroid comprises 15% of total fibroids. Then why it is known as subgenous fibroid? Because it originates from the myocyte adjacent to the uterine serosa, and so it is known as subgenous fibroid. Okay. Then it then it is it grows outwards. That is, it is grow towards the peritoneal cavity. Okay. Then again, it is can be either parasitic fibroid or it can be pedangulated fibroid or sometimes it can be broad ligament fiber that is pedangulated fiber that is pedangulated fibroid means when the subsurus fibroid is completely covered by the peritoneum it will occur a pedicle and so it is called as pedangulated fibroid okay then why it become and how it become a broad ligament fibroid that is the subsurus fibroid when it comes in between the layers of broad ligament, this is known as broad ligament fibroid. Okay. Then coming to the next type, that is some mucus fibroid. Okay. That is some mucus fibroid. We know that it comprises 5% of the total fibroid. Okay. Then some mucus fibroid. Okay. They approximate to endometrium. Okay. And go towards and bunch into the endometrial cavity. That is some mucus fibroid proximate to the endometrium. That is, it goes towards and bulge into the endometrial cavity. The sub mucus fibroid go towards the endometrial cavity. Okay. Then, and what is the next effect? That is, this will make the uterine cavity irregular and distorted. Okay. That is, since this sub mucus fibroid is going towards the endometrial cavity, this will make the uterine cavity irregular and also distorted. Okay. Then what is the importance of this submucous fibroid? This submucous fibroid is the least common, but this is the fibroid which produces maximum symptoms. Okay, that is the importance of the submucous fibroid. Okay, that is submucous fibroid is the least common. That is only five percentage of the fibroid is submucous, but it is producing the maximum symptoms. Okay. That is about the submucous fibroid. Okay, that is submucous fibroid comprises only five percentage. Then it is it grows towards the endometrial cavity. Then why it is uh, what is the important that is even though it is least commonest, but it can produce more severe symptoms. Okay. Then coming to the then coming to the clinical features of the fibroid. Okay. Next that is next we can see what are the main clinical features of the fibroid. Okay. Okay. That is first of all, the main clinical features seen in the case of fibroid are that is menstrual abnormalities is there, then also there is dysmenorrhea, then also fibroid can lead to infertility, then fibroid, there is pressure symptoms in fibroid, then it can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss, and also there is lower abdominal pain, and also there can be abdominal enlargement. Okay. These are the important clinical features that are seen in the case of fibroid. Okay, that is menstrual abnormality. Coming to the first point, that is menstrual abnormality. That is in fibroid, the menstrual abnormality that commonly occurs is menorrhagia or metorrhagia. Okay, we know that that is it is common in clinical practice that we can see the cases of fibroid, and if we are uh, that is if we are taking the case of fibroid, the most common. Menstrual abnormality will be menorrhagia or metorrhagia. Okay, that is menstrual abnormality in the form of menorrhagia or metorrhagia. Okay, the next is this man. This uh, the next symptom is dysmenorrhea. Okay, that is 
we can uh, first, first symptom that is menorrhagia we can say that the classical symptom of the symptomatic fibroid is menorrhagia okay that is the classical symptom of a symptomatic fibroid is menorrhagia okay that is the main importance of this menorrhagia okay then coming to the next symptom that is dysmenorrhea that is there will be dysmenorrhea in the fibroid but it is not so much common okay that is dysmenorrhea then coming to the next symptom that is infertility okay we know that this fibroid can lead to infertility that is in fibroid there are more chances of infertility okay then next is pressure symptoms pressure symptoms means that is increased urinary frequency okay there is a more chance of increased urinary frequency sometimes there is a more chance of constipation sometimes there is a more chance of urinary incontinence okay these are all coming under pressure symptoms of uterine fibroid okay that is about the pressure symptoms okay the next coming in this point is lower abdominal pain okay that is in fiber normally it will be painless but sometimes the lower abdominal pain may come okay then next point that is abdominal lump that is abdominal lump means sometimes there will be a heaviness in the lower abdomen okay that is sometimes the patient may complain that she is feeling some type of heaviness in the lower abdomen or sometimes we can feel a lump in the lower abdomen okay that is about the abdominal lump okay then coming to the pregnancy related problem okay next uh, feature or next clinical feature of this fibroid is pregnancy related some problems are there that is there is a more chance of abortion okay we know that in the case of fibroid it can lead to abortion okay and also it can lead to preterm labor and also there is more chances for IUGR, IUGR means intrauterine growth retardation, okay. These are about the main clinical features of the fibroid, okay. First of all, we have studied about the first main clinical or classical symptom of the fibroid is menorrhagia, okay. Then dysmenorrhea, then coming the infertility, that is it can lead to infertility, then there is pregnancy related problem. Then there is also pressure symptom, then lower abdominal pain may be there. Then there is abdominal enlargement or feeling of abdominal lump. Okay. Then coming to the next point, that is coming to the examination of the fibroid. Okay. That is, first of all, we can deal with abdominal examination. That is, when we can feel and fibroid abdominal, that is, when the abdominal, then the fibroid is enlarged to 14 big size or more, we can feel, okay, that is when the fibroid is enlarged to 14 big uterine size or more, we can feel, okay. Then what are the clinical features that we can obtain while palpating a case of fibroid? That is, first of all, the firm or the feel will be firm more towards heart, okay. Normally, if there is a fibroid, we get a firm feel and move towards heart. Okay. Then the margins are well defined except the lower pole. Okay. That is normally in the case of the fibroid, the margins are well defined except in the case of lower pole. Okay. Then the surface will be nodular. Okay. We know that fibroid is uh, irregular and nodular. So there will be nodular feeling. Okay. Then the next point is mobility is restricted from above downwards, okay, but it can be moved from sideways, okay. That is in the case of a fibroid, the mobility is restricted from above downwards, but we can move from sideways, okay. These are the main points that we, can, we will get in the case of the palpation of a fibroid. First of all, while doing palpation, we get a firm feel more towards heart, okay. The next point is the surface is nodular, okay. Then the next point is we can, that is mobility is restricted from above downwards, but it can be moved sideways, okay. Then coming to the pelvic examination or bimanual examination. That is during bimanual examination, we can feel that this uterine, uterus is unduly enlarged, okay. It is, we know that in the case of a fibroid, that is definitely the uterus will be enlarged, okay. Then uterus is not separated from the swelling by doing that is uh, by manual examination. We feel that uterus and the swelling is not separated. Okay. Then the cervix moves with the movement of the tumor, that's per abdomen. Okay. Then 
the cervix is moved, the tumor is uh, the cervix moves with the movement of the tumor. Okay, these are the main points that we got in the case of the bimaral examination. First of all, we feel that the uterus is unduly enlarged, and the next point is the uterus is not separated, not separately felt from the swelling. And the, when the cervix is moved, it, the, it moves along with the movement of the tumor. Okay, and that can be felt by a dog. Okay, that is about the pelvic examination or bimaral examination of the fibroid. Okay, then coming to the secondary changes in the fibroid. Okay, we know that in fibroid, there will be secondary changes. Okay, that is what are the main important secondary changes occurring in the case of a fibroid. That is, there may be degeneration. The next, there may be atrophy, there may be necrosis, there may be infection, there may be vascular changes, there may be sarcomatous changes. Okay, these are the main important secondary changes in fiber. Okay, first of all, there is degeneration, then atrophy, then there is necrosis, then infection, then vascular changes, and sarcomatous changes. Okay, then first of all, coming to the degeneration. That is coming to the degeneration. We know that the most common degeneration is hyaline degeneration. Okay, that is hyaline degeneration. Okay, the next is cystic degeneration, and cystic degeneration is seen commonly following menopause. Okay, cystic degeneration that is seen commonly following menopause. Okay, then there is also fatty degeneration. Then next is calcific degeneration. Calcific degeneration. This means this is seen. Mainly in the case of subserous fibroid, okay, calcific degeneration is seen most commonly in the case of subserous fibroid, okay, and this is also mainly seen in the case of post uh, menopausal. That is, so that is calcified degeneration is common among the post menopausal women, okay, and in this degeneration or in this calcified degeneration, we they, we will get a calcified mass. And which is known as bomb stone. Okay, bomb stone. Okay, that is in calcified degeneration. This calcified degeneration is commonly occur. Commonly occurs the following menopause. And in this calcified de calcified degeneration, we will get a calcified calcified mass. And this is known as bomb stone. Okay. Then coming to the another de degeneration that is red degeneration. Okay, red degeneration. That is, red degeneration is mainly seen during the second half of the pregnancy and also during the time of birth period. Okay, that is in the case of fibroid, right? red degeneration may occur, and this red degeneration commonly seen during the time of the second half of the pregnancy, also during the time of the birth period. Okay, these are about the main degeneration seen in the case of a fibroid. Okay. First of all, there is hyaline degeneration, then there is cystic degeneration, then there is fatty degeneration, then there is calcaneous degeneration. In calcaneous de degeneration, there is bone stone. Okay, then coming the red degeneration. Red degeneration is mainly seen in the case of the uh, second half of the pregnancy and also during the time of percurium. Percurium. Okay, then coming to the complications of the fibroid. Okay, sometimes this fibroid. Can occur, can have, can uh, sometimes there will be complications in the case of fibroid. Okay, main complication that is there will be severe pain or excessively heavy, heavily bleeding. Okay, we know that in fibroid, the classic symptom is menorrhagia. Okay, this time sometimes this there will be excessively heavy bleeding. Okay, then the, sometimes the fibroid can twist. Okay, this is another complication that is there will be twisting of the fibroid. Okay. Then anemia, that is, if there is severe bleeding, then it can be definitely lead to anemia. Okay. Then urinary tract infection. Okay, there is also chance for urinary tract infection. And sometimes there is also chance for cancerous changes. Okay, these are about the complications of the fibroid. That is, sometimes there may be excessively heavy bleeding, but sometimes there may be severe pain, sometimes there is twisting of the fibroid. Sometimes there may be human tract infection and sometimes there may be cancerous changes. Okay. Then coming to the management of the fibroid. Okay. That is mainly in the case of fibroid, there can be medical management also, there can be surgical management. That is, in the case of medical management, uh, the main drugs are 
we are giving are that is anti progesterone okay that is anti progesterone mainly nucleic cluster okay one group of drugs that is anti progesterone that are giving and the main drug is nucleic progesterone okay then another drug that is giving in the progesterone is danosol okay danosol which reduces the volume of thyroid okay danosol okay then also gnrh agonist are also giving gnrh agonist okay and this will suppress the ovarian function so this gnrh agonist are giving okay this is about the medical management that is anti progestins are given and also sometimes danosol danosol can reduce the volume of the thyroid it is given okay and the progestin mainly nucleoplastin then danosol and also gnrh agonist okay then coming to the Uh, then coming to the surgical management coming to the surgical management normally if the size of the fibroid is greater than 6 cm okay that is if the size of the fibroid is greater than 6 cm it is commonly managed by surgical okay surgical ways okay that is less than 6 cm it is mainly managed by medical ways but if the fibroid is large or the size is to large that is it is greater than 6 cm we are following surgical methods okay then coming to the surgical ways of management of fibroid there is methods like myomectomy okay myomectomy is there then embolic therapy is there then myolysis is there at last hysterectomy okay that is main that is myomectomy then there is embolic therapy myolysis and last hysterectomy then myomectomy what do you mean by myomectomy That is myomectomy. Actually, this portion myomectomy is a detailed portion in the uh, fourth paper. That is periga second part myomectomy. We have to study there. That is, but here we can study the definition of myomectomy. And what is in the myomectomy? That is myomectomy means it is the enucleation of the myometa from uterus. Okay, it is the enucleation of myometa from the uterus, leaving behind a potentially functioning organ. capable of future reproduction okay that is known as myomectomy that is myomectomy is surgical removal of fibroid that is in myomectomy there is enucleation of the myomectoma from the uterus okay enucleation of myomectoma myometa from the uterus and this will leave an organ which is capable of producing or which is potentially functioning which, which can potentially that is First of all, myomectomy means it is the removal or it is the enucleation of the myometa. Okay, and this leaves behind a potentially functional organ, a potentially functioning organ, capable of future reproduction. Okay, that is known as myomectomy. Okay, that is myomectomy means it is the enucleation of the myometa. from the uterus leaving behind an organ functionally capable of producing or future reproduction okay this is known as myomectomy okay then coming to the embolotherapy embolotherapy means embolization of uterine arteries okay in embolotherapy there is embolization of uterine arteries and so there will be avascular necrosis and there will be following there will be shrinkage of the fiber that is embolotherapy means there will be embolization of the uterine arteries okay and so there will be avascular necrosis and following that this fibroid will shrink okay that is what happened in the case of embolotherapy okay this is about the surgical management of myomectomy first of uh, fibroid there is myomectomy is the main management then embolotherapy myelization can be done at last we can do hysterectomy okay this is about the fibroid okay first of all we have study uh, why the fibroid is called so or why the fibroid is called leiomyoma then coming to the risk factors of the fibroid okay then we have studied about the classification of the fibroid okay then after that we have studied about the clinical features of the fibroid then we studied about the uh, degeneration of the fibroid or what are the degenerative changes of the fibroid then we deal with the so when we when then we discussed about the complications of the fibroid then we have studied about the examination of the fibroid then studied about the management of the fibroid mainly medical management and surgical management okay that is all about fibroid okay thank you